In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today is going to come from the book of 1 Samuel. And just to give you a little bit of background in case you haven't been following our series on Samuel, I highly recommend it. It's been so much fun for me. I love, love this book of the Bible. And I think that probably comes through in my chaplain's reports. But where we are in this saga, Saul is, of course, king, and he has been charged by God, been given direct orders from God, go out, destroy the Amalekites, destroy everything they have. Uh, women, children, buildings, possessions, uh, uh, your, your animals, the king, everything. And a lot of people would look at that and say that it's cruel, but really the reason comes down to this. God did not want it in his people's mind that they were going after this for conquest. They were to be basically God's sword here on earth. That when these people had done something evil, when they had, and, and Amalekites were as bad as it gets, they were engaged in things like child sacrifice and, and all kinds of horrible things. So what God wanted to do is to go out and use them as punishment to wipe them off the face of the earth, but he also didn't want them to get the idea, hey, we're doing this for conquest or so that we can get money. The reason that it was important to go ahead and destroy everything is because he didn't want them to think, oh, they were just doing this because they wanted something out of it. No, no, no. The message to the surrounding nations of the Amalekites is, this is divine retribution. You are going in there to destroy everything because it's about punishing them for their sin, not about you being able to get things from them. This is not conquest. We're not venture. Uh, we're not going out here to spoil them. We're going out here to send a message to the other nations that you obey God and you do what he says to do. And if this, the pattern holds to this, this is after multiple prophets have been sent to them, they've been given warnings, all that kind of stuff. And so now it's finally past the point of no return. God tells Saul to go lead Israel's forces and to do this. But he doesn't obey. Instead of doing what God told him to do, he saves King Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and he also takes all the best livestock and brings them back for him. And he by the way, also brings back some of the possessions that he was told to destroy. Now, let's look at that from this angle. I think that if Saul had disobeyed and his disobedience had looked something like, you know, God, you told me to destroy everything, but I got to tell you, I, I, I couldn't do it with the women and children. Like, I, I had to leave them alive. My conscience wouldn't allow me to do it. I have a feeling that God would have been a lot more lenient on him because of that. But that's not what Saul did. Saul destroyed the women and children, but he saved the king, possibly for ransom or possibly because Saul himself was a king and was hoping that nobody would come after him. And he kept the stuff and he kept the livestock. So basically, only the selfishly motivated stuff is what he saved. I, I got to believe that God, just based on his character and, and based on the way he's dealt with other situations, that if Saul had come back to him, that there might still have been some punishment for disobedience, but because Saul's heart was in the right place, God probably would have been a lot more merciful with what he did. But no, Saul was all about getting the stuff that he wanted at this point. And again, like we actually just said in our last one, Saul wasn't always like this. Saul wasn't always out for himself. There's times where Saul is incredibly selfless and does exactly what God asked him to do. Unfortunately, this is not one of those times. And so let's go ahead and, and that kind of sets the stage. Let's go ahead and look in Saul, or sorry, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 13 through 15, and see what that looks like. So 1 Samuel 15, 13 through 15. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowering of the, the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. 
but the rest we have utterly destroyed. This is actually a pretty humorous moment for Samuel. And frankly, it makes me feel better because being the smart aleck that I am, I kind of feel like Samuel and I have a connection here because I love how this is presented. <laughs> Basically, uh, oh, I've, I've done exactly what you commanded, Samuel. Destroyed everything, destroyed everyone. The Amalekites are, are done with now. And Samuel's like, hmm, odd, because I'm hearing some sheep and I'm hearing some oxen coming from the background. <laughs> And then Saul's like, uh, yeah, see, we brought the best sheep and oxen for sacrifice for God. And, and notice the way that he words that is specifically is the Lord, your God. Oh, your God that you worship. Yeah, we totally brought the sacrifices back for him. Right. Samuel's not buying this. And first of all, it's, it's so abundantly transparent that... Saul is eager to greet Samuel, and he comes up, and he's like, oh yeah, we did exactly what God promised. It's kind of like the little kid that he's home, uh, you know, maybe with his parents outside or something, and, uh, you know, he breaks something or winds up hurting his little brother or sister, and uh, comes in, and uh, the kid meets his parent at the door. Oh, everything's fine, and uh, Timmy, he's not crying, and I didn't hurt him. And they can hear the kid crying in the background who's obviously like been punched in the jaw or something. This is the level of ridiculousness that Samuel walks into when he walks into Saul's camp. This is a pretty good analogy of, of what is probably going through Saul's mind. He's like, yep, totally obeyed God's commands. Nothing to see here. We're good. Uh but Samuel knows what has happened. He's already spoken to God. We kind of skipped over that part in the scripture, but he's already spoken to God. He already knows what the deal is. He knows what to expect when he walks into this. It really is one of the funnier episodes in the Bible, which, I mean, anybody that says God doesn't have a sense of humor is not reading through all of the Bible or has is, is definitely missed some of the more humorous stories here. But the interesting part here is that he claims that he obeyed the command. There's a couple different ways to read this. First of all, it could just be that Samuel's trying, or sorry, Saul's trying to cover his behind because he knows he's in trouble. He knows he's done something wrong that he shouldn't have. I think that that's a pretty accurate reading. That tends to be the way that I read it. The other way to read it, which I think is less likely but also possible, is that in Saul's mind, he did obey the command. And unfortunately, this is not impossible because we see this in, in humans today too. Don't we see this with people all the time that they're like, yeah, well, you know, basically I did more or less what God said to do. Yeah, well, he's God. You don't do more or less what he said to do. You either do what he said to do or you do something else. There is no in between here. There's no, I sort of obeyed God. There's either, did you obey God or did you not obey God? He doesn't leave any halfway point. There's no room in the kingdom for fence straddlers when it comes to the kingdom of God. And this is a lesson that Saul is about to learn in absolutely no uncertain terms. And we'll, we'll get to some of the repercussions of that as we go throughout the book. But suffice it to say here before we do any of that, that this is just a very human reaction to all of this. Whether it was Saul really knew that he screwed up and did something that he shouldn't have, but he didn't want to own up to it, which is kind of the way that I look at it. Or it's more from the standpoint of Saul just kind of justified the fact that he disobeyed. Maybe it's a little of both. I really don't know. But either way, there's a powerful lesson there for us, regardless of how you read it. Because if you read it the first way, you kind of look back at Adam, where Adam's like trying to lie to God on whether or not he sinned or not, going back to the very first sin of man. This is something that is just a part of human nature, that the first thing we do is try to blame others, and we also try to defer any responsibility. Yeah, th this wasn't really my fault. Or, yeah, I more or less did what God told me to do. Just like the serpent brings up to Eve. Well, you know, God said that you're allowed to eat the fruit in the garden. Let's just kind of ignore that part where he told you not to eat of this particular fruit. That's kind of what's going on here. Well, did God really say to destroy all the Amalekites and all of their livestock and the king? Yeah, he did. And you don't get to just decide that God doesn't know best. 
You don't get to just decide that I'll do my own thinking and, and I'll just refer to that as being obedient to God's command because, you know, I got the gist of it. I more or less did what God asked me to do. No, he's God. You either did it or you didn't do it. This is a being that knows everything, that is all-powerful, that knows what is best, and what you're doing is second-guessing his judgment. You're saying that I, as the human, am standing at a better place of judgment here to make this call than you, God. See, Saul's sin here is disobedience, but it's also arrogance. He thought he knew better than God, that he could make the call that God couldn't. It's not a good place to be for us. It just shows a lack of trust in your father. You know, sometimes, as little children, when we have, like, a, a medical problem, let's say, and we have to go in and get a shot, like a vaccination... You see, a four-year-old doesn't understand that he really does need the shot, and the shot really is best for him. Like, he can't wrap his mind around why there is any good reason to stick a needle in his arm since it hurts so much. But he has enough faith in his parent to say, I don't like it, I don't want to do it, and maybe he even fights back on it, I don't know. I'm sure that there are kids that do that. But ultimately, they have enough trust, or at least many of them do, Enough trust that their parent, who has always looked out for them, that has loved them, that wants what's best for them, if he says, I have to get the shot, okay, I have to get the shot, even if I don't really understand why I have to get the shot. That's what Saul failed to do here. He decided that his judgment was better than God's, that he didn't really need God to make this decision for him. It was a bad call, and we'll see the fallout of that later on. And if we want to see the fallout of that play out in our lives... All we have to do is just mostly do what God said instead of doing what he actually said to do. See, it all goes back to faith in our Father and respect for his commands. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them, I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter, and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.